Um, let's have a little bit of a, a pre-see about you. So Sarah is a lifelong 14, having been raised on a 70s diet ad, um, TV ad, sorry, of um, Arthur C. Clarke and in search of, as well as Unexplained magazine. She's a lay researcher and applies academic rigor to phenomena that lie just beyond our current understanding. Sarah is an ASAP registered investigator and an active member of our local paranormal team. So from one of us in the NRPI to another person, over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That makes me sound really grand. Um, but I think probably like a lot of us in the paranormal community, um, we all find our little passions. And this particular um, case is a passion of mine. So I'm just going to share my screen. So this is a, a case from 1959, which happened in a, a sort of a fairly remote area of Russia. And I first read about this probably about 15 years ago. It was a very short article in 14 Times. And ever since then, I've just maintained a real fascination with it. And I think it's actually quite a good example of how how important it is as you know a truly skeptical inquirer that you, you keep your mind open because every now and again, I reach a point where I think that's it. I've, I've worked out what happened. That's the explanation that fits. And then another piece of information comes to light that doesn't fit in with the overall theory. And I kind of go back to square one. So um, people that want to ask questions at the end, please don't expect me to be able to say to, say to you, yep, that's definitely what happened because it's still very much a mystery. So just to give a bit of background um, to, to the case. So the um, this instinct concerns um, the fate of nine hikers who were students at um, a polytechnic um, in um, in Ukraine and there were nine of them in the expedition all of whom were, were really really experienced um, sort of trekkers hikers they were actually taking undertaking this hike because they wanted to qualify as um, sort of level three guides which would mean that they'd be capable of leading um, other individuals other sort of hikes other parties into sort of really severe um, sort of terrain where they would be needing to sort of camp spend time under canvas um, sort of very much having to fend for themselves and um, this particular hike it was a grade three hike 186 miles um, and there was a requirement that they had to spend a sort of quite a, a, sort of a significant chunk of that away from inhabited regions. So the expectation was is that if they got themselves into trouble, they would be ne needing to find their own way out of it. Um, the group was made up of students from um, sort of local, uh, the local polytechnic. And as I said, they were all very, sort of, they're quite hardy uh, individuals. Um, the two women on the on the expedition, um, Lude Miller was somebody who had um, she previously on a, a, a sort of another expedition she'd been bitten by a snake um, and had sort of had to be carried out from um, from sort of a remote area and the whole time was apologizing to the people having to carry her saying you know I'm sorry that I've uh, I've you know caused this problems um, other people there was um, Rustin who was sort of famous for having fought off a bear with a hammer that had run into the camp so they were all really sort of you know tough individuals Quite a lot was made of um, uh, sort of the older member of the team, um, a chap called Semyon, who you can see in the bottom left of those photos. Um, he was a, a World War II veteran and he was significantly older than the others, but he'd been brought in specifically because of his experience in hiking. And it was felt that he could sort of um, oversee the, the work of the hikers and make, making sure that they were undertaking the required tasks to get their qualifications. Um, and he's sort of seen very much this like sort of slightly shady individual and potentially with KGB um, connections, which I'll come on to later when we come to some of the sort of possible theories around it. But actually, there isn't really any firm evidence to say that he was anything other than somebody who was like so sort of really, really um, experienced in hiking. So on the 23rd of January 1959, um, the group agreed a had submitted their their route to the um 
to the Polytechnic Hiking um, Organization to say this is this is the route we're going to be taking. This is how we're going to evidence that we're meeting the requirements of a grade three hike. And they were issued a route book, which sort of basically sets out the, the route that they're going to follow. And part of that journey um, included them traveling by truck and train into um, an area called Second North. And that's like an area that, that's sort of it, it's right on the edge of, of the wilderness. It's it's Second North is where the um, the last in, uh, town was the last sort of opportunity to have um, sort of shelter in a in a sort of a solidly built shelter. Um, with houses and to be able to have a sort of hot food that was prepared on the stove. Everything from that port onwards was going to be very much sort of, they were hiking, they were taking the absolute minimum because they were obviously going into very severe snow conditions. So they had to minimise what they were carrying with them, only the absolute basics, um, to the extent that the tent they were carrying um, was actually two that had been stitched together. It's five cameras because they needed to document the, the sort of route that they were following. And they also took um, a sort of a, a group journal which they filled in um, every day with sort of observations of what they've been doing um, and also just like sort of kept it as almost like a personal diary. Uh, yeah I've been talking about the people that were um, on the expedition that they were very um, experienced hikers um, that they were um, this wasn't their first expedition they were all people that you've got a lot of experience and the reason why they were doing this expedition was because they actually wanted to qualify as um, hike leaders. Um, Nine of them on the expedition. There was um, a 10th member of the expedition, um, a chap called Yuri Yurden. He actually had, um, amazingly, he had rheumatoid arthritis, yet still he went hiking in the Ural Mountains. Um, but when he reached the sort of the last settlement before they, they sort of go completely into the wilderness, um, he was suffering from a flare up of his condition and he felt that he was, he just, he wasn't fair on the rest of them to carry on. Um, and some of the sort of information about the, the group and the mood they were in has come from Yuri. Um, it actually affected him quite badly. He found it very difficult for many years afterwards to talk about what had happened because he felt that he should have been with them. Um, but one of the things that he was sort of able to, to confirm is that there wasn't any bad feeling amongst the group because there had been these um, some theories that maybe there was some romantic rivalry and that had resulted in a fight between the men. Um, and he was out, he was very clear that, no, that's not what had happened. The group was in really high spirits. Everyone was looking forward to the really challenging part of the hike, which is when they went out into um, the uninhabited regions. Um, so they get to this, this last sort of staging post and... Um, set off on the 28th of, of January with Yuri having to turn back um, at, on the same day because he's too unwell to, to continue. And three days later, um, the group arrive at the Highland area. Um, they're, they're planning on um, going to Mount Alterton and they're because of the worsening weather, they actually have to, to stop at an area that's called Kolat Sikal, uh, which translate roughly um, as Dead Mountain and quite a lot has been made of the fact that of this name Dead Mountain that it means something sinister. Um, what it actually means for sort of the local Mansi people was that they called it Dead Mountain because it was so sort of bleak and windblown and um, sort of sub-zero temperatures and what have you that, that there was never any game on there so it was it was also known as um, don't go there and it was basically it wasn't a warning it was it's just not worth going there because you won't find any game. Um, the last journal entry um, was on the 1st of February, and um, the, it, it, this recorded that the group hadn't been able to reach their intended destination because of the worsening weather. Um, they'd reached a, a point whereby they were having to sort of forge through almost waist deep snow with um, sort of the, somebody at the front going forward, um, forging a path through the snow and then waiting for the others to, to, to sort of catch up with them. And they were sort of rotating through the group doing that. Um, and they reached the base of um, sort of coming up to sort of Mount Austin in this, in this pass, which has come to be known as the Dyatlov Pass because of um, sort of the associations with the hype leader, um, Igor Dyatlov, who's it's for some reason, I think it's because it was his mission, his his expedition that he organised. So it's always sort of he's become the person that's sort of synonymous with the with the events. So they're absolutely exhausted. And um, this is this is where they are. It's right. I mean, my geography is terrible, but it is a really, really um, remote area. And um, it was 
not necessarily the most direct route to their intended destination, but um, people that know the region well that have hiked there subsequently have said, actually, it makes perfect sense that they stopped there. There was nothing sort of sinister or unusual about the, why they sort of chose to stop there. It was just literally because of the, the conditions they were facing. Um, they decided it was much more sensible to stop where they were overnight and then start afresh in the morning to try to get to, to Mount Orterton. So um, they built basic um, sort of shelter. So they would have flattened an area of, of snow. They'd got a tent with them, which was a very, very basic tent. It was it was two sort of, um, which is basically just two flaps of canvas, to be honest, with a triangle at either end, like the old sort of Boy Scout um, tent. And they had a very basic stove with them, but that wasn't lit, um, probably because where they were, they were well above the tree line, so they wouldn't have had any fuel available to them. And obviously they weren't going to be carrying around um, sort of wood or, or logs or anything like that. They also set up um, a separate store area for their belongings um, and then sort of took off the, the wet clothing that they'd been um, wearing during the day because it got sort of sodden with, with snow and with sweat and um, laid that over the, the floor of the tent to provide an extra layer of, of sort of insulation. Um, and then sort of that was it. They were going to go sleep um, for the evening. So we've got the we've got the diary entry, the last diary entry, which records. Um, you can see like sort of the map of, of where they stopped. And um, the last entry says tired and exhausted. We start to prepare the platform for the tent. Firewood is not enough. We didn't dig a hole for a fire. We're too tired for that. We had supper right in the tent. Hard to imagine such, such comfort <laughs> on the ridge with a piercing wind hundreds of kilometres from human settlements. So that is the last entry um, in the journal. So whatever happened, um, we believe happened at some point during the, that sort of following night. So there was no when they didn't when the group didn't return there wasn't initially um sort of a huge amount of concern because they were seen as being you know very experienced hikers um it was felt that you know if if they were four or five days um overdue from returning from this hike it wasn't too much of a cause for concern um but eventually they were it got to a point where they were uh, sort of a week overdue from being back from the hike and families were starting to worry and it was families that actually sort of pushed the local um, authorities into starting a search for the, the hikers. Um, the initial search party was made up of local huntsmen, which, again, sort of counters some of the theories about the group having been attacked by local uh, tribes, people who might have been angry about them encroaching on their land. Um, there was also quite a lot of people from the, the second north settlement as well that had seen the, the group as they passed through. They were brought in uh, to help with the search. Um, and on the 26th of um, February, the searchers find the abandoned campsite. Now, if you look at the tent, one of the what again, one of the theories that is sort of put about is that there was a, a slab avalanche, which is basically where. Um, you get a layer of snow that starts to melt, um, then it refreezes, more snow on top of it. And as that snow builds up, eventually you, it becomes unsteady and a slab of snow will come down and it sort of becomes like this moving slab of snow that is um, will wipe out anything in its path. What you can see from that is that um, that's the photo of the tent as it was found. And you can see that the poles are still upright. Um, the, there's a, 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 a ski that's also upright. Interestingly, there's also um, another ski pole there, which has been cut in half. And that's significant because the group weren't um, carrying any spare equipment. So it wouldn't have made any sense for them to have cut one of their ski poles in half. So that's one of these sort of where searchers are starting to see some small details, which don't really make sense as to as to why the group would have done this. Um, it had been cut open on one side. Now, I've I've gone backwards and forwards on this because there's evidence. Uh, it, they say I've, I've initially when I was reading about this, they say that the tent was cut, cut open from the inside. I've also read reports where they say, well, actually, no, if you look at the way it's been cut, it's been cut from the outside. I don't think it really matters um, whether it was inside or outside, because actually cutting open your only means of of, of Sort of shelter and survival in those conditions just does not make sense. So regardless of whether it was cut from inside or outside, it was a really, really strange thing to do. Um, but there's no signs of a struggle. 
um, which again, the, the searchers are a bit, well, well what's happened there? It's, the tent is here. There's no sign of um, the, the hikers. There's a few belongings scattered around. Um, around the entrance of the tent, they, they noticed that there were some sort of um, like coins, matches. It looked almost as though people had been asked to turn their pockets inside out. And warm winter clothing had been left by left nearby and really surprisingly boots had been left inside the tent. So, again, for really experienced hikers, they would know that leaving your tent in sub zero conditions without appropriate clothing without, and certainly without appropriate footwear, um, you are very, very quickly going to succumb to hypothermia. But despite this, this warm clothing has been left lying around and there are um, eight or nine sets of footprints. Um, leading down from the campsite by people who appear to be either barefoot or in socks. Um, it's They think the way that the footprints appeared, it looked as though people had either been walking in the tracks of the person in front of them or they'd been walking side by side, but they were certainly weren't running. It was a very sort of measured walk down the, down the side of this uh, sort of mountain slope. That's a picture of, of the tent. You can see how basic it was. It literally is just... A, a triangle of canvas and you can see again the sort of the extent of the cutting um on it it's the whole side has been completely slashed open so that tent would have been absolutely no use um for shelter um in any kind of exposed position um it's been rendered absolutely useless by the cuts that have been made to it so same day, sorry, the day after um, the searchers find the, the tent, um, they find the first of the two bodies, sorry, the first two bodies um, of the hikers. And um, it's the, the two bodies are found down actually in the tree line. So the footprints have indicate that the, the group of hikers have come down the, the slope of the hill. Um, they've come to the tree line and um, Two of them, for whatever reason, have remained at this point. And the first thing that, you, that um, sort of struck me, so these are actual photos that, as of the bodies as they were found, is that um, they are in very, very unusual positions for people who have died from hypothermia, because generally people will curl up in a ball because you, you do that to sort of preserve um, body heat. And these two individuals would have known that that's the thing to do. Um, also, as well, you can see just how poorly clothed um, they are. And one is on his front, um, one is on his back. And they're found under um, a large cedar tree. And it's approximately um, one mile from the tent, with a direct line of sight. But actually to get to it, you would have had to do sort of almost quite a, a, a sort of a dog leg um, round through the forest um, over a sort, of, um, a sort of small cliff area to get to that point. So it's almost like they've chosen this point because they, they can look back and see what's happening back at the campsite. Um, but without being visible um, from their campsite. And as I said, they're both in this very unusual prone position. And not only are they really poorly clothed, but some of their clothing has actually been cut from the bodies. So at this point, the searchers are thinking, well, you know, is it, have they, is it the other people that are with them that have maybe um, taken the clothing from them to keep themselves warm? Um, have they found them? Sort of dead and that's why one of them's face down one's face up they've moved the bodies around um to try and sort of get the you know see if they've got anything on them that's that's worth taking with them to see if it just helps keep themselves warm or what have you um but it really doesn't make any sense to the searchers as to why that they these two people would have been in this position also really strangely is that um, a fire is burned for 90 minutes and then being extinguished, despite the fact that there's loads of, of dry wood around them. Um, they've got matches in their pockets. What they do find is that the tops of um, sort of low trees, the sort of, um, when I say low trees, it was like sort of the, the pine trees that were just starting to grow up. So sort of um, they've been cut off at about waist height, but there was no evidence of any kind of axe or knife that they could have used to have done that. Um, and the broken, there's also um, one large cedar tree um, there, which is about sort of 20 foot high, up to a height of about 16 foot, um, a broken branches, along with traces of skin and blood. So somebody has tried to, to sort of climb the tree. And from that point, they've been trying to look back towards the camp. There's this sort of unobscured view back towards the camp. Um, 
So they carry on searching and they find some more bodies. And this is where things really start to become very strange because firstly, if you, the, the position that some of these bodies are found in just don't make sense, firstly with the injuries, but also um, when, a, when somebody dies, um, blood will pool to the, to the lowest level. And um, so you, you would expect to find what they call cadaver spots, which is where the, the blood is sort of gathered and the will become um, sort of quite uh, flushed, sort of purple, um, black tinged. Um, and Zinia is found lying on her side in the snow. Um, she was, it looked almost as though she was trying to crawl back towards, uh, towards the, the campsite, but she's got cadaver spots on her back, which means she's died on her back, but somebody has moved her onto her side. She's got this absolutely huge contusion on her right side. Um, so it's 12 inches long, two inches wide, and it looks almost as though she's been hit with a stick or a branch, um, <clears throat> something that has caused this sort of blow, and it wraps right, um, right around her side. And she's also got fingernail-shaped cuts on her hands, so it's almost as though she's she sort of clenched her fists to the extent that her, um, her nails have dug into her hand. And the the, um, the search has also noticed that she's got, as you can see in this picture, she's got a lot of sort of grazes, contusions um, around her around her face and on her hands, almost as though she's been beaten about the sort of the hands and face. Um, Igor is found um, the same day. He's um, under a, a very sort of shallow layer of snow. He has these U-shaped contusions on his face, which you can't see particularly well in this face, but they were described as looking as though um, he'd been hit in the face with a with a rifle butt. And he got icicles around his nose and mouth, and that usually happens when somebody has been face down um, in snow and still breathing. And he got bloody foam in his lungs. Now, the bloody foam is, is significant because um, that is indicative of... Um, somebody who has had some kind of um, sort of stress or trauma on on their chest as they're still trying to breathe, and um, one explanation could be that they he's been sort of stuck under some a quite heavy weight, so perhaps there's been a fall of snow on top of him. Um, other explanations are that somebody's actually knelt on his chest and been preventing him from breathing. Again, he's got these sort of marks on him which are. Um, described almost as being like sort of self-defense marks. He's got these contusions on his cheeks and on his hands, and he's got um, abrasions around his wrists, as have Xena, um, which the rescuers sort of feel could almost be indicative of there having been sort of um, rope marks. And then Rustin um, isn't found until uh, a week later, um, again, under a, a sort of shallow layer of snow, He's face down in something called a corpse bed. Um, and what that means is that usually when somebody um, in, in cold conditions, when somebody dies, their body heat will melt the snow around them. And then um, as the body cools, it will refreeze. So you effectively end up with somebody almost in like sort of a bed of ice. And, and that's the, the sort of the position that that's the sort of the conditions that uh, Rustam is found in. Um, however, he's face down when he's found, yeah. but the, um, sort of the the cadaver marks, the blood pooling is on his back. So somebody has turned him over onto his back um, since he's sorry, somebody's turned him over onto his face um, at some point since he's died. And he's got a huge skull fracture um, on his left temple, which was almost certainly the cause of, of his death and blood around his right kidney, which is suggestive of some sort of external blow to his back. And again, bloody foam um, in his lungs and blood in his chest cavity. So some very violent injuries to these individuals um, that are found almost in a, in a sort of a line leading back to the, to the tent, but under a very shallow layer of snow. So to me, you can discount the idea that injuries were caused by any sort of avalanche. So a couple of months goes by before they find um, the remaining bodies and they're found in what's described as a snow den. So that's almost like where they've um, sort of excavated um, uh, like a hollow in the snow um, to be able to sort of go in there, sort of shelter from the shelter from the wind and have some sort of um, warmth from sort of being the prox in, in proximity to each other. 
And you can see here, there's one of the rescues. You can see how far down it was um, under the snow. They would have put they put branches down um, to provide a degree of insulation. But one of the strange things the rescuers find is that there's four piles of clothing. Um, so in each corner of this snow den is is a nice discarded item of clothing, which seems a very sort of bizarre thing. Um, no sign of bodies until they decide to um, explore a bit sort of further downhill from um, this snow dam. And they find um, under the snow, there's a there's a stream running. And in that stream, they find um, three more bodies. Um, that's how they were found. It was um, you can see it's, it's pretty difficult to because sort of, it's all black and white photos. But um, you can sort of see the ears of, of sort of two of them. Um, up at the top, there's a, there's another one slightly down um, from them, and then across the these three bodies is um, Ludmilla, and she's almost at a sort of a perpendicular angle to them. So I've sort of tried to overlay it so you can see the positions that they were they were found in. So not in the snow den at all. Somehow they've ended up sort of travelling down the slope and ending up in the stream. So. First two bodies to look at, um, they were in a pretty poor condition, having spent um, sort of several months by this, well, certainly several weeks, um, partially submerged in a stream. Um, Alexander has got extensive bruising on the right side of his face. So again, he's there's, there's these head injuries. Um, it wraps right round um, right round his head to the base of his neck. So it's sort of huge amounts of bruising. And again, he's got um, bloody foam in his lungs and in his chest cavity, but also he's got a crushed thyroid cartilage and that's it's basically your Adam's apple. And generally that's an injury that only happens um, when somebody has applied some degree of force to your neck. So it's an injury that is typically seen when somebody has been strangled. Um, Ludmilla, um, she has, uh, this, is, this is one of the really weird bits. She has the tongue uh, she has her tongue and base of mouth missing. So often they talk about the sort of other reports I've seen, initial um, accounts I read, it just talked about her tongue being missing. Um, but probably the most accurate book that I've read, um, where they've actually got the autopsy reports, it says that it's the whole of her, it's the tongue, it's the base of her mouth. It's this, this huge area of tissue is missing. And she'd also got blood in her stomach, um, which suggests that some of that bleeding from her tongue being removed happened while she was still alive. Her eyes are missing. Um, whether that is because of post-mortem changes, I don't know. The original post-mortem talks about there being microscopic bleeding around the edges of her, of her eyes um, that is indicative that her eyes were removed while she was alive. I don't know if that how they could have told that, given how long the body had been in the water for and sort of post-mortem techniques at that time. But that's certainly one account that I've read that they believe that um, there's evidence of bleeding around those around her eyes, which suggests that they were removed while she was alive. However, what we do know for certain is that um, with her tongue, because of the amount of blood in her stomach, which is about 300 millilitres, um, that significant amount of bleeding has, has happened while she was still alive. Um, she has also got a crushed thyroid cartilage and again um, indicative of somebody having applied a great deal of force to her throat um, and also a mobile hyoid bone which um, which is uh, again very very indicative of um, some sort of crushing force being applied to her throat. And she had, um, sorry, half a litre, not 300 millilitres. She had 10 broken ribs, but all on one side. And they were multiple fractures. Um, so she, she, it wasn't just a sort of a, an isolated rib fracture. She had, it was all down the one side. Um, in fact, if you look at the picture, you can see on the left-hand side, that her chest is, is sort of partially collapsed. So again, some really violent injuries. And then Nikolai and Semyon. So um, Nikolai had got a bruise in front of and under his right shoulder. Now, that is a very unusual place to have a bruise. And the autopsy, um, the conclusion was they felt that his it would it had been caused by his arm being forced up behind his back. Uh, his right his right arm being forced up quite violently behind his back, whether that was by another person 
or whether that was um, through some sort of traumatic fall, impossible to say, but it was a, it was a strange um, injury. He'd also got a huge um, skull fracture um, wrapping right round from the the, sort of the side of, of his head to the base of his skull. And it was um, such a, such an extensive fracture. There were actually um, pieces of, of bone fragment um, in his, um, in his brain. And he had uh, bloody foam in his lungs and what's called a dry heart. And what that means is, is that um, death has been so instantaneous that the, um, the heart stops just as it's pumping and it doesn't have another intake of, of blood. So it, whatever happened to him, it was it was a really sudden, um, sudden death. And then finally, Semyon, um, again, he was um, his eyes were missing. Um, bearing in mind that all of all four of these bodies have all come from the same setting. They were all submerged in water, yet they all seem to have um, sort of different injuries and different um, sort of body parts missing. Um, skin is also missing from around his eyes. Um, his nose is being is described as being pinched closed, um, as though somebody sort of for, forcibly hold, held it there. And he's also got these extensive um, rib fractures to the extent that um, it's something called a flail chest, which is basically where your ribs um, become detached at, in sort of at, at both ends of the rib, so that you 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 are not even able to breathe properly anymore. Your, your sort of chest wall is completely collapsed, <clears throat> and not surprising, he's got bloody foam in his lungs. So, some very very violent injuries. Um, other things which were very strange was that um, some of the bodies tested positively for beta radiation um, and there didn't seem to be any obvious source um, at the time as to where that could have come from. Their actions in leaving the tent didn't make particular sense. Um, the autopsies concluded um, that people, that everyone had died within sort of um, eight hours of each other. It was felt that it all happened within sort of the, the time frame of um, overnight or sort of a single night. Um, the official conclusion was, was that um, Ludmilla Semyon and Nikolai's deaths were classed as violent and the others had died from hypothermia. So bearing in mind, you've got people who've got skull fractures, who've got evidence of um, contusions, who've got evidence of extensive bruising, defense-like marks, um, contusions around their wrists and ankles um, suggested of having been restrained in some way and that they've been found the positions they're found in is not the positions that they've died in bearing in mind the cadaver marks on them and um, they'd all died died within six to eight hours of their last meal which is why we, it seems reasonable to assume that it was um, sort of the night after they put that last entry so they put the last entry in the diary um, there's they're saying that we've had a cold meal um, Sort of going to going to sleep and then something has happened during that night. They didn't carry out any toxicology or histological um, examination. Why that was, I don't know. Um, whether it was to do with sort of the sort of the limited availability and no information released about the condition of the internal organs. So again, it's I don't know whether or not they actually did anything um, in terms of the autopsy and that information has been lost or if it was just never completed at the time. So the official conclusion was that a compelling and unnatural force had caused the hikers to flee the safety of their tent. And the investigation was concluded by um, the end of May. So the same month that they found the last of the bodies, the, the investigation was concluded and the file sent to an undisclosed uh, location. Party officials um, really pressured the families to have funerals at um, the nearest town rather than the hikers' respective hometowns because they were really concerned about the publicity that this incident had um, attracted. And they also um, insisted on a high police presence on the day. So that also seems slightly strange that there was this sort of interest at a, a sort of a, a national level um, from government in, into this incident. And they also insisted on closed coffins for the Snowden bodies. So Two of the Snowden bodies were the ones that showed some traces of radioactivity. Um, tradition at the time would have um, expected a, an open coffin funeral. That was the tradition at the time. And 
so it was very unusual that the, there was this insistence on closed coffins. Admittedly, the bodies were not in a good state. They would probably have been quite distressing for people to see. Um, however, again, it's just this other, another layer of, well, that seems a bit out of, of character. So some alternative explanations. Um, I've picked out the main ones. So there's this, as I said, I've mentioned about the radiation. Um, some of them, it was reported that their skin appeared to be sort of deeply tanned um, and potentially um, that could have been the result of having been exposed to some sort of chemical or, or radioactive chemicals or um, as some theorists have put forward, they believe that potentially it could have been they were that the uh, hikers were exposed unintentionally to some sort of weapons testing. The area um, where it happened um, at the time was um, recorded on a military map as um, number 1079. And um, some some of the books that I've read, um, they refer to it more as 1079 rather than Kolat Sikar. Um, it was certainly an area that was very uh, interest to the military because it was so remote. There were so rarely people there. It seemed like sort of a fairly sound location for them to undertake military testing. Um, we know from um, contemporaneous records that on the night when we believe, because it was some point overnight between the 1st of February, the 2nd of February, that there were two um, bear bombers on test and they were dropping air mines in the northern Urals. Now, air mines are things that they um, they are designed to go off in midair and they create this huge pressure wave, um, which people that support this theory say, well, actually, that could have caused the massive internal trauma injuries um, that we see with these broken ribs. Um, skull fractures, um, but it wouldn't have necessarily caused any external trauma. I find that really hard to believe because surely if it was um, these these aerial mines, then all of the hikers would be showing the same um, same injuries. Um, a catabatic wind, which I'll come back to later, but that basically means um, it's a sudden drop in temperature can cause a, a really uh, violent wind to spring, spring up. Um, Carmen Street Vortex, um, which is basically a type of, um, sort of wind pattern which can create infrasound. And we know that infrasound is, is something that's often put forward as an explanation for people feeling um, sort of sensations of disquiet, of unease. Um, and the theory is, is that this uh, can't, the, the, sort of the infrasound panicked the hikers into leaving the tent. Then there was another avalanche. Oh, sorry, there was an avalanche and that's how they all sustained their injuries. Um, again, to me, that doesn't really explain everything. Um, there were uh, there was a, a an airbase um, fairly nearby. If you're talking about flight paths, 125 miles away, and um, it was uh, home to some um, sort of military aircraft. And those would have regularly overflown. They would have made considerable sound. Um, Potentially, the hikers might have been frightened by thinking that the, the, the noise of these planes was going to cause an avalanche. So, um, again, they abandoned their tent and went down to the um, to sort of the relative safety of the tree line. And Semyon, this the older guy that I mentioned at the start, um, who wasn't who, who wasn't a uni, uh, polytechnic student. Um, he there were these sort of ideas that he was potentially linked to the KGB. Um, he was buried at a cemetery which was closed at the time. So there must have been a very specific reason for the, for the authorities to allow that cemetery to be reopened and for his burial to take place there rather than with the rest of the group. So, uh, oh, and then, yeah, I mean, it just goes on and on. Um, is it to do with the spirit of the place? Did they um, disturb some sort of primitive ancient god? Um, uh, Menke are sort of local uh, abominable snowman uh, creatures, aliens, you name it, people have, have suggested it as an explanation. Um, the closest thing I have felt to an explanation um, until fairly recently is something called the Holgrim um, theory. Um, Holgrim was, is somebody who actually went back to the same location um, did some trekking and sort of came up with the idea that um, actually it was a, it was a combination, it was like a sort of a a stack of cards effect that had, had happened so um the group had been sort of trekking over trekking in these really sort of harsh conditions they were cold they were tired their clothes were wet from snowfall and from sweat 
And um, as soon as they got into the tent, their priority was to sort of take off those wet clothes um, and to sort of spread them out on the floor of the tent, which was certainly what was seen um, by the, the rescuers. Um, and then during the mid-evening, uh, this extremely cold gravity wind, wind sort of came up, which is this catabatic wind. And that would have very, very quickly um, started to pull the tent apart. And the, uh, the people inside knew that their only ch chance of survival was to keep that um, tent intact. So they decided that the best thing to do was to swiftly um, evacuate. So to actually cut a one clean cut that should be easier to repair um, than a sort of tearing their way out. Um, and they then piled snow on top of the central part of the tent to sort of protect that collapsed area of the canvas. And that fits in with the photos that you see where the two ends of the tent are still standing and the centre part has got this, this sort of is weighed down with snow. And then they walk down in a very sort of controlled pace um, sort of down to the down to the tree line. Um, so sort of the two two of them, um, Krivonoshenko and Doroshenko, attempted um, to build a fire because that would have been a priority for keeping warm. And um, the other seven went off to try and dig um, some snow shelter, a couple of snow shelters. And um, Doroshenko climbed up the cedar tree to try and see what conditions were back at the tent, whether when it would be safe for them to return. Um, however, unfortunately, whilst the others are, are sort of digging the snow dens, that's keeping them warm, the physical activity. Um, the two men at the fireplace um, end up succumbing to hypothermia. And the last thing that they, they do to try and keep themselves um, warm is to actually put their sort of arms and legs into the into the phasing fire because um, Doroshenko, was, when he was found, he'd actually got um, third degree burns uh, to his leg and um, to his hand, which seemed, again, didn't really sort of make sense as to why somebody would have would have allowed them, you know, would have, would have, could have sustained such a significant um, injury when there was snow all around them that he could have put his hand into, his leg into to sort of uh, treat those treat those injuries. So the, this, this theory says, well, they were putting them in their arms over this dying fire, trying to keep themselves warm. And at some point, uh, Doroshenko has become unconscious and then he's, he's basically died with his, his arm and his leg still in the fire. Um, and that's what's happened. Um, and the rest of the group have managed to finish the snow shelter. So they come back um, they find that their friends are dead. They cut the clothes off them and they retreat back to the, um, the snow shelter. And they they. This, the theory is that they dug two separate shelters and they're divided into two groups. Um, so Dyatlov, Slobodin, Kolmogor, so um, Rustam, Igor, um, uh, Zina are planning to stay in the, um, the den that is closest to the tent and the other team, the other, the other four are going to go to the, the snow den further away. And theory is that this snow den collapsed, trapped, um, four of them causing these significant crush injuries. Remaining hikers attempted to return to the tent, but they also um, succumbed to hypothermia. And stretching it a bit further, severe fractures on the skulls, um, chest injuries may have been caused by rescuers using snow probes. That was, I felt, as close as things got to um, a sort of a, a fairly coherent explanation as to what had happened. Um, but then I sort of started sort of digging a bit deeper. Um, there's some really interesting photographs um, available because the, the hikers had got this camera with them. They were documenting um, everything as they went along to provide the evidence for their level three um, qualification. This is, is always re reported to be the last um, photograph that was found on the camera. Um, unfortunately. We haven't got the original uh, negatives of these, um, so this is very much, I feel, hearsay evidence. Um, but sharpening the this image um, appears to show um, the outline of three heads looking at a bright light source. So when I first saw this, I thought, oh, it's, it's like an overexposure. That's a light bulb in the centre um, and some sort of lens flare. Um, underneath the line at the bottom right that looks like um, a hair or something on the um, on the photograph, um, when it's um, sort of brought into to greater focus, you can see these these three outlines of what looks like heads looking at a bright light source. And 
McCloskey, who who says that he actually had sight of the original negatives, although some were missing, some there were some unexplained um, emissions from the negatives. They weren't all there. They weren't um, presented to him in any sort of order, uh, and it was it was clear that some had been removed from the original sets. But cross referencing, he felt that this showed actually showed an approaching light source. Um, and that the light source was increasing in size as though it was something that was coming towards the camera. Um, and that's the outline. Um, I've sort of highlighted it a bit there, but you can see, I mean, I don't know, is that fingertips? Is it heads? Very difficult to say. However, some um, oral evidence from other hikers in the area was that they were seeing the night of the um, 1st of Feb to the 2nd of Feb, they were seeing strange lights in the area in the sky. Um, also, some very strange images which looked a bit like planes. Um, I think it looks a little bit like a Sukhoi, which is one of the planes that would have been around at the time. But again, when you blow things up from an old negative to such an extent, you know, it, can you take that as absolute evidence? Um, oops, sorry, get rid of that. Um, I mentioned about this this abominable snowman type theory. There is um, this one picture, which is again in one of the last photos taken by the group um, before they reached the pass. Um, and there's questions as to who this was. Um, whoever it was, they're purposely framed. So I, I believe that the person that took whoever was taking this photo knew that whoever that is um, was it. You know, they they could see them. It wasn't you know something that they'd missed as they were taking the photos. They absolutely could see that person. They were framing them in the photo. However, the clothing and the build doesn't appear to match any members of the group. So was this um, another hunter whose path they crossed? Um, was it someone who'd been following them? Impossible to say. And then things started to get, things get really, really weird when you start to sort of, you know, move away from the traditional explanations that have been around sort of avalanches, um, people potentially being attacked by um, soldiers or um, local huntsmen, you know, when you start to dig a bit deeper as to what goes on in that area, um, there's some really weird stories about intelligent lights. Um, I've just sort of picked up um, a couple because these seem to, to sort of correspond. They sort of, the, the two accounts support each other. Um, this chap, Yuri, was working um, in an open pit mine and he talks about seeing these strange shaking white lights. Um, and what's weird is as he looks at them, the lights seem to realise that he's there and the beam turns towards him. So he looks away because he's frightened by what's happening and the beam of light moves off him. So he looks again towards these bright lights. And um, again, the beam of light starts um, moving towards him. And more so, there's a, a couple of the lights um, sort of detach themselves from the main group and start coming towards him. Um, and they seem to be swinging and they're moving fairly quickly across the forest, far quickly than um, anybody sort of in that forested area could, could move. And now there was sort of four or five of them moving towards him. And um, it said that, um, you know, he, he, ha he has this, again this thing where he when he looks at them they start moving towards him when he looks away they stop move they, they the beam of light turns away from him and this goes on for um about an hour before um he's, he's sort of he's, he's fairly confident that the the lights have moved on and um you know really really disturbing experience he tells his workmates about it um they think he's absolutely lost the plot that he's been drinking too much vodka um, that he's making things up just to scare them. Um, and then um, there's a, an account um, published um, of uh, a, a reserve forest ranger who, lo and behold, has seen something very, very similar. Um, and again, he talks about these, these beams of very, very strong light, um, the impression being that it's um, sort of some sort of floodlight because it, the, the extent of the forest that it's covering. So far more than could be explained by somebody holding um, a sort of an LED torch, for example. 
And it's also at a, a height above the ground, which is above where a person would be walking. So again, and this is, this is an experienced forest ranger. He knows what he's looking at. He knows what to expect to see in the forest. And this is something that he would not expect. Um, and again, um, he talks about the lights swinging and that as soon as he looks at them, that they start rushing towards him. And that as they come towards him, they start to multiply. So it's no longer just one or two lights. It's a sort of seven or eight of them. And again, he's he realizes very quickly that when he looks at them, they move towards him and they shine on him. But if he looks away, that they seem to sort of lose lose interest in him. And he this ca carries on for um, an hour and a half. And he realizes that actually he's, he's they've moved on from him. They're now some distance away um, and uh, that he feels that he's now safe. And he describes hearing this sound like um, almost like an electrical discharge. The lights have gone and he suddenly feels this strong gust of wind, which lasts for two to three minutes and then all's quiet. Really, really strange. So conclusions, what conclusions can you draw from it? Well, I don't believe that Avalanche explains how the hikers came to leave their tent or the range of injuries they sustained. Um, skull fractures, um, crushed thyroid bones, um, missing tongue, missing eyes. It just doesn't, Avalanche just doesn't explain it. We, we, the range of injuries is, is, is too diverse. Um, really strangely, once the investigation was closed, the authorities um, also closed a 200 square mile area around the campsite location, which was closed to anybody but government officials for the next three years. Which seems a little bit excessive, um, you know, given that this was an area where people um, and it wasn't it wasn't hugely um, and it wasn't a, a tourist area by any means. But it was certainly an area where experienced hikers um, would go and would train. But um, the government closed it off for the next three years. Um, as I said, the cadaver marks on some of the bodies um, indicate that they had moved post-mortem. There's absolutely no doubt about that um, because it, it, that is a it's a biological fact the way that blood settles. Um, if you die on your front, that's where the blood will settle. You don't die on your front and end up with these cadaver marks on your back. Interesting as well, um, pilots overflowing flowing the area the day before the searchers actually reached the campsite reported seeing two bodies by the tent. So were the two bodies down, the first two bodies found down by the um, in the forest area, is it possible that they'd be moved from up by the tent? Um, talked about the fact that they'd got um, abrasions around their eyes, wrists and ankles, which suggested being blindfolded and restrained, um, along with self-defence wounds. Um, there were no external wounds associated with the bone fractures. Um, so if somebody had been like a skull fracture where that is significant enough to cause um, splinters of bone to go into someone's brain, you would expect the skin to be broken. Um, but there was nothing like that. It just appeared as though they'd been subjected to this huge amount of pressure. Um, crushed thyroid cartilage, mobile hyoid bone, that can only be caused through direct pressure to the necks. Um, radioactive contamination that they found could only realistically have come from three sources. Um, there'd been a nuclear accident at um, Mayak, which was um, the biggest, uh, I think it was one of the biggest uh, sort of uh, nuclear accidents um, in the world until Chernobyl. It was a really significant incident and um, some members of the group had actually been involved in the clear up. So potentially that might have been where it had come from. Um, it could have been um, some tests that had been carried out or um, it could have been that one of the group was carrying radioactive material. But again, why would they be doing that when they were a group of hikers? Um, the Once the initial search um, party had found the bodies very quickly a high-ranking intelligence officer was um, brought in um, by the authorities and he was ordered to oversee the investigation um, and then he was subsequently recalled um, after he'd noted contradictory evidence so it was basically those in authority didn't like that what he was finding so he was recalled and the group diary showed some very clumsy attempts to obscure details or so bits had been rubbed out um, there was um so pages had been torn things crossed through um and it there was just it was just a lot of inconsistencies um but he'd be but 
nothing really added together. An anomalous light phenomenon continues to be observed in the area. And the mystery continues really, um, because um, in 2018, um, Semyon, so the, the older member of the group, um, his remains were exhumed. If you remember, he was the um, individual who was buried in a cemetery, which was um, closed at the time, and it was um, ordered to be open just for his, um, for his uh, funeral. And they looked at the, the body and um, said that it was characteristic of somebody who'd been knocked down by a car. So that would kind of be consistent with the described injuries of him having this huge skull fracture um, and um, sort, of, sort of injuries around his, uh, his chest. However, when they did DNA testing um, on that body, there was no similarity to any of his living relatives. So whoever is in that grave, it was not Semyon. Which raises questions then about whether um, any of the closed coffin burials that it actually is the original hikers that were in those coffins. So th there does seem to have been this huge um, attempt by authorities to get the investigation wound up as quickly as possible for evidence to be um, sort of taken and sort of sent off to an undisclosed disclosed location and for everything to be sort of wound up as quickly as possible. Um, the picture at the bottom is the uh, monument um, that was put up to the to the hikers. People still go there, people still go hiking in that area. Um, Nothing subsequent, nothing has, nothing sort of similar has happened um, since this uh, incident, but it remains very much an unsolved um, mystery. So, um, well, I don't think we're ever going to get the, the complete answers without a time machine as to, as to what happened. Um, but I find it absolutely, an absolutely fascinating um, case. Um, I keep reading books about it. I keep reading articles about it. Still don't know what all the answers are. I'd be really interested to know what other people's thoughts are about it. Okay, Sarah, wonderful. Thank you very much for a thoroughly deep dive into the topic that is often known as the Detloff Pass incident. Um, thank you very much for sharing the story. And uh, for those who don't know, I mean, it really is a mystery that is held now for what? It's 60 years or more. Mm. And it is, is a topic that still you know, generates the mystery of what really happened to these people. And of course, understandably, there is paranormal elements. And, you know, I've, I've heard alien elements, as we all have. And I think the very first time I heard this topic, again, was, was for two times, I think I read. And then I saw uh, the History Channel do a documentary on it. And then I saw part of that clip used in Ancient Aliens um, in, that <laughs> season, in season one. And actually, out of all the uh, the presentations and stylizing uh, that I've seen to video. That is still perhaps the best one. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a fascinating story. It truly is. Yeah, and I think it's as I said to me, it's it always feels like a bit of um, my my tiny reminder that you just never or never assume that you've reached a definitive conclusion on a case because there's always other evidence that can turn up that can sort of. To completely throw the conclusions that you'd previously reached. Yeah, because I, I believe that there was a, um, I'm not quite sure 100% of this, wasn't it in 2020 there was a, an, an official review of that? And there mm. was there was a um, a report put out and the, the kind of re report suggested, or it, it concluded, sorry, that it was the avalanche theory. Yeah. Um, we used it to a slab, a slab avalanche. And um, and that's what caused the unusual injuries that they were buried under snow, and that a lot of people were actually their families were quite annoyed about that because mm. it, much like you said there that they clearly have other injuries that clearly tell a different story and that's kind of being put to one side and they feel that it, this is a murder case as opposed to being a natural disaster case. Yeah, if if people are interested, if my camera's working, oh. this is the best best book. Um, because it's actually got, um, let, me find, uh, let me find it. Uh, it's got all the autopsy reports in, so you get you get all the pictures with all the the wounds on. And to me, this was this was where I think when I read this one, I thought, well, that it 
it can't be avalanche because how have people died in one position and been found in another one? That just doesn't doesn't add up. No, absolutely. So what do you think about the, the high strangeness factor, of course, of these the lights that appear to be orbiting? And I've seen potentially from hundreds of years in that particular area. Yeah. I think they play into the story that's held in in the paranormal circle uh, because they are, they're associated in the same area. Is that what's kind of keeping the story alive? I I think so, because I my sort of I'd kind of gone along um, with sort of Holgrim's theory. I thought potentially there may have been it might have been that they'd witnessed some military exercise. They got caught up in that. Um, I certainly didn't think there was anything um, other than a sort of very sort of earthbound explanation. But those the intelligent lights and the fact that you've got um i mean those are just two accounts that i i pulled out because i thought they were interesting because they kind of corresponded to each other um that is so weird the idea of lights that it's like quantum almost isn't it that they are just by looking at them you have an effect on them and they come towards you um and i mean certainly the the guy who's the forest ranger this is somebody who spent years out in you know out in those wilderness areas he knows what what he's looking at um and he couldn't explain what it was. Um, I think, unfortunately, because of the situation we have now um, with the Russia-Ukraine war, the likelihood of us being able to get any more material is, is non-existent. It would be great if those um, the McCloskey photographs, you know, he, he had access to the negatives. Um, and that's where he sort of took some of these prints and did some analysis. Um, I mean, unfortunately, it's hearsay unless you actually get to see those original prints. Yeah. Um, but it, it would be fascinating to know a bit more about that. And his his thing that he said that nine of the original 36 had been removed. Um, and again, that would only have been after the hikers had died. That's whoever's developed the, the photos on those films. Because I had read also that the, um, the individuals who appear to have radiation burns on them or radiation kind of effects were actually buried separately in zinc mm. coffins. Um, yes. To protect them. I mean, that's... Yeah. That, that's, a, that's an... That's an odd decision to make. Yeah, it, it it's just, I mean, yeah, the presence of, of radioactivity. Um, because actually one thing I didn't say was that um, one of the things that, again, the, sort of, uh, the guy who was doing the initial investigation thought was strange was that um, when the searchers started looking around the Snowden, there was this one of this, this official guy that had come from sort of... Um, Sort of central authorities who started going around testing things, testing with it like a like a radio, um, what do you call it, okay. Geiger counter, as though he was expecting to find radiation, which oh, just seems a really strange thing to do because why would they be radioactive? Um, and it's only some of it was only two of them that they found traces of radioactivity on, bearing in mind as well that they've been submerged in the stream, which would have reduced, you know, because of the radioactive decay, it would have, you know, it would have brought the the load down hugely um if it was if it was something that one of them was carrying surely they'd all have a level of radioactivity in the bodies yeah for sure sure i mean i, I guess i mean i guess here we are having a conversation and there's questions over here i know i should really cut just slide across here and have a look so um in terms of questions around here i mean there's a lot of thank yous a lot of uh well done well put together um a discussion here so jackie tonks makes the uh the great example here the people do take their clothes off in late stage of hypothermia yeah paradoxical clothes. undressing absolutely yeah so uh, it does fit it's paradoxical why would they take your clothes off because you feel yeah. so utterly cold that you feel like you're sweating yeah yeah i think yeah and and that that makes that would make sense if they had been found by the tent but the idea that they would go out of the tent in a state of undress, because they'd be warm in the tent, but then to go out of the tent in an undressed state, that's a bit that doesn't make sense to explain for me for experienced hikers. Um, Bill Air, I love that about the missing tissue, cattle mutilation. That was my immediate thought. Yeah. Um, cattle mutilation seems to have like really dropped off the radar. Um, but yeah, the idea that they got these kind of radiation like burns, missing tissue. And like I said, this thing about I, I keep going back to this thing about the fact that somebody's tongue is missing and the and the base of their mouth, and the sort of the 
very sort of mundane explanation is, oh, well, it's, it's, it's post-mortem decay, it's predation on the bodies. Why has she still got her lips? Surely that would be, you would take that rather than sort of the tongue. So, yeah. yeah. I was going to push that a bit more on myself, actually, regarding your views on animal uh, predation. I mean, obviously, there's a result of animal predation after death. You know, how likely is it, you know, and does it align with the position and the state of the bodies? I mean, you are right there. I mean, you would think the first thing they would go for is the, the eyes, the lips, mm-hmm. the nose, and obviously the ears. Um, obviously they're unaffected, but it's the top. Yeah, yeah and um, there's one of the bodies, I think it was Doroshenko, he got the, the very tip of his nose was missing, which they believe was due to predation. Um, and he was the one who was found on his back um, in just a, um, under the tree, so not covered by snow. All the other bodies were under a level of a layer of snow, so they wouldn't have been necessarily exposed to, to predators. And certainly, those in the stream, it was um, it was a stream that was underlying sort of fifteen foot of snow. So, I don't know, carnivorous fish seems a bit unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crazy bike. Um, so, were the white uh, were the hikers aware of this area having uh, military activity and testing? If so, why would they go into a dangerous area like that? Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, it was certainly an area that was that people would go to for hikes. Um, at the time they were hiking, there was another party from the university who actually helped with the, the search. Um, but I think um, sort of Russian military activity is pretty much clouded in mystery. Um, it seemed to be the yeah, military activity seemed to be primarily um, aerial activity. It was it was um, military aircraft that was overfly- overflying. However, they did actually find, um, again, in the, um, oh, there's so much of it, I can talk about this for hours, but um, when they found the two bodies um, under the cedar tree, um, there was a, um, a length of winding cloth, which was, could, could have been some of the sort of putties that um, soldiers would have used at the time. Um, again, the trouble is, is because nobody, it, it wasn't like a controlled crime scene. So you get these little tantalising snippets of, Oh, yeah, well, they found that was potentially indicative of, of there having been military personnel there. But actually, we, we haven't got we haven't got the photographs. We haven't got the sort of contemporaneous eyewitness accounts to kind of go with that, other than like this brief statement about length of cloth looked as though it could have been um, like a, a winding cloth that somebody's used. So uh, Jackie Tonks makes the comment that I heard that they also hiked up a sacred mountain that was of local indigenous people, which might have upset them, and they might have gone out to find the group. Yeah, so this is this theory, the local Mansi people. Um, so uh, Kolat Sikhar was, um, was supposed to be um, it's one of their, um, a bit like Uluru, I guess, in um, Australia, that it was like sort of seen as a sacred place. Um, and um, as I said at the start, it's, it translates variously as dead mountain or don't go there. And I think that was seen initially as being a lot more sinister than um, it was in reality. That the don't go there, dead man, refers to the fact that it's not worth going there because there's no gain. Um, the, I think that the Mansi people actually helped with the initial um, search, which had they had it been a group of them that attacked the hike, because it kind of wouldn't make sense that they, they helped um, with the hike. Uh, sorry, that they helped with the search for the hikers. Um, the journal records them coming across some, um, or when they're on the trail, they come across some signs um, and some markers which are indicative that there are local Mansi people hunting um, in the area. Um, but again, it's just kind of, well, why this group of nine? Why why this group of nine? No one before, no one after. Got you. And if they were involved, why would they help with trying to find them? Um, Mark Wallace asks, um, I've also found Mountain of the Dead by Keith McCluskey, uh, Return to Datlov Pass by J.H. Uh, Moncrief, I haven't read that one, and uh, Death of the Nine, um, all on eBay. Um, so, of course, if there are people who want to follow those books up. Uh, yeah. Please, could you show that book up you had earlier, just so I can get a... Yeah, uh, a I, can, I can put a link. So, um, Death, of, Death of Nine is really good. Um, Dead Mountain is also really... I've, I've got... <laughs> I've got so many, and this one, um, it, this one's a bit, it, 
in the end they go into um uh, like a uh, a Ouija board exchange <laughs> with, oh, really? with the dead hikers saying oh yeah we'll tell you what happened what so what what did they say what was their response oh that it was um that they were killed by the KGB I think it was <laughs> I'm not um, sure if it was that simple <laughs> yeah but I mean, they say that that this is the equivalent to the JFK assassination for, for Russian people. It's this kind of enduring mystery that mm. everyone believes that there's a degree of conspiracy in it, um, and that you know you're never gonna, we're never gonna know the full truth. Well, I don't um, know. I think Trump said something quite interesting as it last week. You know, he's actually going to release those JFK files this week. Oh, has he? Oh. Yeah, that, that was part um, of the promise. <laughs> Who knows? Look at those questions. Um, was there evidence that the tongue was surgically removed? Um, it just says that the tongue and the base of the mouth is missing. It doesn't actually say um, surgically removed. Um, and there wasn't blood found around the bodies. So um, Lyudmila, although she, I mean, bearing in mind though that she's she's found in the stream, so any sort of um, blood would have washed away, but they don't find blood in the snow den or around the snow den, um, but she has got this this blood in her stomach. So uh, there's a question here about uh, there was a movie based on it, right? Yes. Has there been more than one? Because I think there's been more than one. There has, and there's also um, an, uh, a TV series um, which I bought on DVD, and it's in Russian, <laughs> which is a bit unfortunate. Um, but yeah, there's there have been there've been films about it. Um, I think it's it sometimes crops up in podcasts. Actually, there's been a lot of podcasts, but um, oh, I'm trying to think because the one there's like it was it 1990s, I think was the first one, first film that I saw. And there's been a more recent one where it's like the, I'm the sure time there's like shift a 20, or something. Yeah, I'm sure there's like a 2010 one, or yeah. that, that kind of era. So, um, Bill asked the question here about a missing soft tissue. There might have been what you already answered. Sorry, um, like here's to have something in common with the cattle mutilations of North America. Um, I think, yeah, we, you touched on that earlier. Maybe I'm just, there were so many questions earlier up. Um, I think the, the force <gasps> through detectives borrowed from this incident of the tongue removal and high strangeness. I like the thing somebody's put about the Philadelphia experiment. Yeah, it's that wrong place, wrong time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, this, so some interesting hallmarks of ritual trophy killing with the eyes, tongue removal. Um, yeah, they they so they didn't all die. At the, yeah, you're right, Darren. They didn't all die at the same time, but it's within sort of a, they think an eight hour time frame because of the state of digestion of food in their stomachs. Um, and yeah, the the whole thing with the clothing they were they were wearing, um, particularly the ones in the snow den, were wearing a really strange combination of different people's clothing. So oh yes, True Detective. Yes. Yeah, that was the tongue removal, yes. So has there been any new evidence that's come out of it, like uh, modern technology, the way we can apply uh, more modern techniques to look at these cases again? Has there been any kind of like satellite imagery or like forensics that have been done more recently about this? I don't think so. I, I think probably the most, there was a documentary, um, which was, I think, 2018, which was when they actually went back and spoke to some of the people, spoke to Yuri, um, and that's when they they did this testing and found out that it wasn't semion in the in the coffin. Um, but I don't think there's been anything more recent than that that I'm aware of. And, and the kind of appeal, you know, um, you know, what makes it so compelling to people? Is it the fact that there's this mystery um, within a case that appears to be unanswered? Is that what's holding people and attracting people? I think so. It's a bit like Jack the Ripper, isn't it? It's the fact that without a time machine, we're never going to know. And that um, I think anything where there's, that, where there's an idea that there's a conspiracy in the government cover up people. And we all love that, don't we? Like the idea that the mysterious they are, are out to get us. Um, I think that's part of it. And um, I think. It just it, it's just really it's just really eerie, the thought, particularly when you read about some of the injuries, when you think, well, you know, these. It is just such a bizarre thing to happen. And I think for me, it's um, it could be completely 
misleading the thing about the you know the missing eyes because that they would act, you know that would be one of the first things that would would go um to predators but that just seems so horrific that the idea that someone's eyes and tongue were removed when they were still alive uh, there's a question here that's obviously got a couple of uh, thumbs up about it too so uh, what animals live in the area that could be the predators um things like um i think it's bears foxes um Probably it would probably have been foxes that that did the damage. There weren't any sort of big major predators because um, it's certainly that time of year. It's it's too it's too bleak. It was you know it, you're talking about um, middle of winter. Um, things like bears would have been hibernating. So my understanding is it would be things like um, sort of foxes. So there's a, there's a question here. Rather, I've, I've heard that some kinds of sonic booms or sounds can compress internal organs and cause bleeding. Mm -hmm. Quite boss of mine. It's not something I'm too aware of, but I can imagine a, a sound wave could carry something that would compress. Um, yeah, and that's the idea of the the aerial mines that that could have. That's what could have caused the the injuries. I think again, for me, what I find really fascinating about it is that there are so many explanations that that account for parts of it, but it's something that ties it all together. Um. And I don't. I, I think it's you know it likely is. It, it's a combination of factors, but but sort of working out what that is because, um, as I said, the Holgram theory with this you know that they'd um, the catabatic winds. They'd then gone down to the tree line. They tried to dig um, snow shelters, but then you and then subsequent trauma to the bodies being caused by the um, search party because they would have to use these long poles that they kind of push down quite forcefully into the snow. Um, maybe maybe i don't know it still feels it still doesn't feel quite right and that coupled with the sort of the strange lights um and certainly the hikers that were um the hikers that were around in another part of um sort of the valley um at, at the same time over at, over the first and second of february talked about seeing these really strange lights um in the sky <coughs> over the area um but again it's you know we've we've got very limited photographic evidence we've got the the raw um autopsy reports we've got the accounts from the searches but we know that some of the information was removed some of the files were removed um and even that why why would they do that why would why would the government want to to cover it up it just seems very strange i mean julio asks the question that i guess is a lot on our mind is that i uh, have any of the families tried to reach out to learn more because i guess if you, particularly in regards to the gentleman whose body is not in the case, <laughs> mm. uh, I can imagine their families will be quite, um, what, what's going on? And is there, is there a mystery here deeper? And are, we want answers. I mean, mm. what do you think their position is right now? Do you think they've spoken out publicly? Has there been any kind of... They, they spoke to, with the, um, sort of the 2018 documentary, they went and spoke to um, some of the families and they sort of spoke of their frustration of the fact that... Um, there's a there's this, the official explanation a compelling um a strange and compelling force at an avalanche um they they just feel that it's not the story of what happened to their loved ones and they want to know what happened um and i think the sad thing is of course is is that we're talking 65 years ago now so living relatives are few and far between now yeah i can imagine doing grandchildren now aren't we so mm. And they're all, um, apart from Semyon, when they're all in their early 20s. Yeah, they were really young, weren't they? So, mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd certainly um, echo uh, John's comment here. That it's a great talk, actually well-researched and put together. Thank you very much. This is uh, our, our webinar for this evening. I believe that's been absolutely fascinating. And, and to have such a deep, in-depth conversation that isn't led from a paranormal perspective, it's led by mm. the data. And then you can weed out what's left, what the mysteries are. And I think mm. that can tell us a much more compelling story. Um, and it provides everyone a factual position where people can talk about it again. Yeah. From a position of, of data, information, and what really happened as opposed to going, well, it's, it's already started with the spooky stuff. So wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. What I'll do as well is I'll, I'll um, get together a book list and stick it on the, um, the thing on the Facebook page so people can, because there are some dreadful books. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, is there books worth avoiding? 
Oh yeah, um, I can't remember what it's called. Um, is it, is it, no, it's not Death of Nine. No, there's there's one where it's it's the one where it ends up with the. Um, there's one where they say it, the explanation is it, absolutely brilliant up to the point where the guy says, and now I'm going to tell you what happened. And it was a carbon street vortex. And it just like you can see him like shoehorning all the stuff in. There's a really good graphic novel if you're a fan of graphic novels. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, but I, for me, if you can spend your money, um, Death of Nine, the Atlov Pass mystery is the one to go for because it's the one that has got the autopsy reports on. And um, you can also, you can actually, um, I'll see if I can still, if the link is still up to the original autopsy reports as well. because um, It's just quite interesting being able to sort of see those and um, sort of the diagrams of, of the injuries and things like that, that, um, you know, I think when you, I think when you can look at the, look at the facts and then kind of draw your own conclusions from it. Yeah, wonderful. Totally fantastic. Um, Caroline has made a mention to me to say that uh, next week's webinar will in fact be the lovely Caroline giving a talk and it will be taken on the topic of the Museum of East Dorset and research and investigation of the property herself. So Ooh. I think uh, that topic, that sounds wonderful and I'd be loving to learn more about that. But uh, Sarah, thank you very much for joining us here today for this fantastic webinar. We've rolled out an hour and a half. So how about that? That's fantastic. <laughs> So thank you very much for joining us here today and everyone uh, have a good night and uh, this will be up uh, available to YouTube and to Rumble and to, to Bitchute very, very shortly and uh, to all a very good weekend. I should see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Fantastic. Bye bye.